Welcome. Christianity is a religion of paradox. After all, one of its central claims is that God became human. Throughout Christian history, this paradox has been worked out in various ways. Today, we'll focus on one of these, the saints, that is, the righteous dead commemorated by later Christian generations. From the 5th through 15th centuries, whether in Russia or Ethiopia, whether in Rome or Jerusalem, Christianity was defined in part by shared ideas about saints. But today we'll also focus on one saint in particular, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Taking Christian art as our guide, we'll look closely at how the elaboration of ideas about Mary depended upon earlier ideas about Jesus and their intersection with later cultural and political norms. The New Testament Apocalypse describes martyrs as saints, that is, hagioi, or holy ones. But once Christianity was legalized and martyrdom ended in the Roman Empire, the righteous dead were oftentimes no longer martyrs. But some Christians were still remembered and celebrated for various deeds, such as missionary activity, teaching, or miracles. Sometimes this is called the cult of the saints. but we have to be careful here. In modern English, the word cult has a negative meaning, but it comes from the Latin word cultus, which has a neutral meaning. Cultus refers to care, reverence, or the observation of particular duties. The Latin word cultus does not denote an authoritarian religious movement. Technically speaking, therefore, the cult of the saints means the care, reverence, and the maintenance of duties surrounding the righteous Christian dead. The commemoration of saints gave rise to a new literary genre called hagiography. The word hagiography literally means holy writing, but it generally refers to stories about Christian saints. We know that some, perhaps many saints, were real people. But are the stories about them real stories? Here we encounter something of a difficulty. Is hagiography a form of historical writing, or is its purpose primarily Christian edification? How you answer this question will fundamentally shape how you interpret hagiographical writings. If you see them as strict history, then you will probably be more likely to see them as fanciful and hard to believe. After all, they are full of miraculous healings, exorcisms, and even monstrous creatures. However, if you see hagiography as a kind of historical but pious fiction, it becomes easier to appreciate because the values and beliefs communicated in the story become the major point of focus. Let's illustrate this with an example. Some saints appear in every part of the Christian world. Consider St. George, who allegedly slew a dragon while rescuing a princess. If George was a real person, then he likely came from what is now modern-day Turkey. There is art of him from places as diverse as Ethiopia, Russia, and elsewhere. In fact, the design on the flag of England is called the Cross of St. George. St. George is said to have traveled widely, preaching the Christian message and exhorting virtuous deeds such as aid for the poor. But are we really supposed to believe that, on his travels, he killed a dragon? If we assume that the story is literal, then we will probably reason that those who told the story were gullible for believing such a thing. But what if the story was not really historical? What if it was written to inspire those who lived long ago? From this perspective, hagiographical literature is a kind of Christian mythology. That is, the real meaning is found not in the events of the narrative, as if they were historically factual. Rather, the meaning is found in the story's mixture of entertainment and edification, both morally 
and spiritually. This might help explain why there are so many different stories about so many saints. Myths multiply, not because they are false, but because they are such a powerful way for communicating values. Hagiographies are not just about history or its pious embellishment. There is another element that we should keep in mind, the supernatural. It may sound strange to some people today, but almost everyone in the ancient world believed in supernatural events. The same was true in later centuries. When we read a hagiography, we often find the claim that at the tomb of the saint in question, miracles happened. Healings, exorcisms, and conversions, but healing above all. Without reliable medical care, it is impossible to overestimate the appeal of promises of healing. We find this in medieval literature about saints. Entire books collected various miracle tales, sometimes dozens upon dozens of them. Reading these stories can get quite repetitive until you realize that repetition is a kind of revelation. The need for healing was everywhere. From the records of still later centuries, we know that in some places, more than 75% of all pilgrims sought healing. As Christianity spread, a kind of Christian geography spread too. The tombs of the righteous dead became places of pilgrimage to and from every part of the Christian world and pilgrims consistently sought cures, sometimes psychological and frequently physical. Hagiographies no doubt embellished history, and no doubt they sometimes abandoned history for the sake of devout edification. But they also reveal something to us today. In a world without effective medical care, the possibility of healing was no small thing. By the fifth century, one saint towered above the rest, and that is Mary, the mother of Jesus. There is little discussion of Mary in early Christian sources. We find a bit in the Gospels and Acts, and a small number of other early Christian writings contain stories about her, perhaps factually true, perhaps devout if legendary, and perhaps all of these. But it was only in the 5th century that Mary became a subject of theological discussion and sometimes debate. Briefly, if Jesus is both fully divine and fully human, then he must have gotten his humanity from somewhere, or better, from someone, and that is Mary. In popular Christian devotion, by the 5th century, some Christians called Mary Theotokos, a Greek term that means God-bearer. Sometimes this term is translated as mother of God, but God-bearer is more literal. Others, however, deny that this term was appropriate. In fact, Two 5th century councils debated the matter. In the end, it was agreed that the term Theotokos is acceptable because Mary bore Jesus and Jesus is God. As Christian cultures developed within and beyond the Roman world, the memories of martyrs were joined by the memories of other saints. Across the Christian world, Mary had several feast days. One was her purification in the temple after Jesus' birth. Another was associated with her death, or rather, with the widespread belief that she did not die, but was assumed, that is, taken directly into heaven. Even if it sounds odd, consider the humanity of it. What kind of son would allow his own mother to die? And if Jesus is the perfect human, he must also be the perfect son. Here, we see the human element in religious belief. One form of culturally relevant elaboration came in the portrayal of Mary as a queen. This may sound strange to some, especially Americans and any others who don't live in a monarchy. But in truth, there are different kinds of queens. Here we'll note just three. One is the queen regnant, that is, a queen who reigns on her own. But there is also the queen consort, that is, the queen who is married to the reigning king. And finally, there is the queen mother, that is the mother of the reigning monarch. It's this kind of queen, the queen mother, that matters here. In the New Testament, Jesus is spoken of as a king. In Christian monarchies, Mary was understood as the queen mother, that is, queen by virtue of Jesus' kingship. These distinctions are lost on many today, but they were not lost on people 
and earlier eras. In medieval Christian monarchies, queen mothers had an important political role to play, namely that of intercession before the king, whether for someone, or perhaps a group in need, or some other noble cause. What was true of earthly royal courts was assumed true of the heavenly court. If you needed someone on your side, who better to have than the king's own mother? And this, all the more so, if the king was Jesus, the perfect king. Despite some popular myths, no one believed that Mary was a goddess. Rather, her queenship was predicated upon Jesus' kingship. From at least the 5th century, the motherhood of Mary was a central and uninterrupted theme in all Christian devotion in every part of the Christian world. It remained so for more than a thousand years. Christian cultures elaborated earlier Christian ideas about Mary. Christian art offers significant insight. Here we see an Ethiopian representation of Mary. There are several important forms of symbolism, all of which can be found in Christian artwork in the Roman Empire and elsewhere. First, and like Jesus, she has a halo. In Christian art, saints always have halos. Second, she wears blue, a color associated with purity. Third, there is a star on her clothing. This is based upon the New Testament, in which a star shone brightly above Jesus' birthplace. Finally, if you look at her right hand, you see two fingers pointing down. This symbolizes the Incarnation. One finger represents the divine nature in Jesus, the other represents his human nature. In fact, Jesus' hand shows the same symbolism, albeit in a different way. We see the Incarnation with his pinky and ring finger joined together, but his other three fingers are all pointing a different way, and all three point the same direction, to symbolize the Trinity, the union of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But if Mary was a kind of queen, she was also a mother. A good example comes from this Russian painting. It portrays the sweet kiss. That is, Mary presses her cheek to that of the infant Jesus. In this way, idealized portrayals of Mary were a kind of counterweight to the ascetic renunciation of marriage and family. If monks and nuns, through chastity and other virtues, lived a kind of angelic life here on earth, they also lived a form of existence quite unlike the average Christian. By portraying Jesus and his mother so tenderly, Christian families saw ideals that they could both relate to and strive for. In later Christian history, Joseph, the father of Jesus, was added to these idealized representations of family. In modern manger scenes, for example, Joseph is, like Mary, placed next to Jesus. But perhaps surprisingly, Mary's importance was also a product of asceticism. By singling out Mary, we find ascetic autonomy. A mother portrayed without the father, a wife portrayed without the husband, a woman portrayed without the man. But seen with Jesus, we also find motherhood and its wider web of familial and societal relations. Leaping west to a very different part of the Christian world, this 15th century painting also captures the paradox of the Incarnation. Here the divine infant is suckled by his human mother. There is both devotion and emotion here. For devotion, who doesn't love a devoted mother? For emotion, who isn't moved by such a tender scene? By showing Jesus in such very human terms, God was brought closer to the human level, and, by showing Mary so close to God, she was, in a sense, elevated beyond our level. Devotion may thrive on paradox, but it also has its own kind of coherence, and that coherence most resonates at an emotional level. So what? Mary instantiates the great paradox of Christianity, that, in Jesus of Nazareth, the fully divine became fully human. Importantly, paradox is not about logical consistency. Later in Christian history, the playfulness of paradox was critiqued, especially by some Protestants. That critique was sometimes quite harsh. But until then, Mary's import would not be challenged. 
Rather, it will continue to be developed in ways that Christians found culturally meaningful. By idealizing Jesus as the perfect son, we find a kind of moral code about how men should treat women. This influenced much later and even recent Christian history. A modern Ethiopian hymn makes this clear. The Holy Savior spoke, Respect my mother. Emmanuel spoke, Respect my mother. Jesus said, Respect my mother. Through Mary, and eventually through other female saints, women were given a public presence in some ways quite unlike what they had in pre-Christian Roman society. If you're interested in learning more, these books are worth consulting. First is Peter Brown's influential study, The Cult of the Saints, Its Rise and Function in Latin Christianity. Now available in a second edition, what was true of Latin Christians was no less true of Christians elsewhere. Turning to later medieval history, Diane Webb's book, Pilgrimage in Medieval England, takes a deep dive into one particular locality, looking at the intersection of geography, pilgrimage, and healing. Finally, in her book, Mother of God, A History of the Virgin Mary, Mary Rubin offers an expansive international study of Christian ideas on the Virgin Mary before the 16th century. That's all for now. Thanks so much for watching. Please hit the subscribe button, feel free to leave a comment, and I'll see you next time.